So please welcome Lauren Ornelas. To pay you all later for that. Oops. <laughs> Too high for me. Well, thank you all for coming um, for this day. And um, just talk a little bit about Food Empowerment Project. We are a vegan food justice group. And so what we try and do is try and connect the issues of the impacts that our food choices have on human and non-human animals. Because as far as we're concerned, all these issues are connected. It's really difficult to separate the oppression and the suffering that non-human animals endure and ignore the plight as well of human animals. Um, I just wanted to do, so we have a, I'm going to go through my talk, but I just want to let you know our website, foodispower.org. It is fully translated in English and in Spanish, and I'm not going to talk about this one part of our work, which is um, the worst forms of child labor um, and slavery in the chocolate industry, but I just wanted to thank Hope as well as this conference for really respecting and really understanding why it is that we encourage people, and we do specifically talk about vegans, not to support chocolate that's sourced from the worst forms of child labor, including slavery that takes place. Um, a lot of people will sell vegan chocolate and talk about vegan chocolate and say it's cruelty free. But if it includes the slavery of children, if it includes child labor, it's not cruelty free. If children are enslaved for it, if children are forced to work for it. We have children as young as seven years old working in the cacao fields using machetes, which is actually against international law. You have children who are locked in at night. If they don't move fast enough, they're beaten when they're working. You have children who are sold or are stolen, who are trafficked hundreds of miles for the chocolate industry. And so we really appreciate that this effort, this conference, this event here, made a decision to make sure that anybody who sold chocolate here had to meet our recommendations, which is not sourcing from those areas. And as far as I know, this is the first event um, that has done something like that. So it speaks a lot for the organizers of this event. And it speaks a lot for those of us in the Bay Area who are going to be supporting organizations like this when they put on events, that they aren't making a separation, that they're understanding these connections. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with our list, um, basically we have a list of chocolates we recommend. Again, this is based on not any type of certification, but based on the country of origin. And then we have a list of chocolates we don't recommend and we explain why. We also have it in app form, so you can download our apps for free. We have one for, I always want to call this the Google phone, the Android. And then we also have one for the iPhone. So they're free to download, and we encourage everybody. Um, we update our chocolate list once a month, constantly getting input from people, adding us to add companies. Again, the com because if we are a vegan organization, the companies have to at least make one vegan chocolate in order to make our list. Um, but we do update the list every month with new companies. We also have a website called veganmexicanfood.com, which is also fully in English and fully in Spanish with recipes. So now I'm going to go into what this talk is about, and it's about what is sustainable. And the reason why I chose this topic is because I was invited to help a conference that was organizing in the North Bay on sustainability. And when they asked me about some of the speakers that they were having, um, they were having speakers, say, from Dell Computers, and they were going to have a Dell speaker come and talk about sustainability. And as having worked for the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition, I'm very aware of what happens for the electronics industry and who's impacted by that. So I asked them, you know, what's your definition of sustainability? Then we started talking about food. And they understood that I was vegan, so they understood that veganism was going to need to be a part of the conference. But again, I asked, what is your definition of sustainability? And how do you define it? So I started to think about more as how do people define sustainability? I'm sure there's many of us who define sustainability as making sure that we don't buy paper napkins. And at home, we have cloth napkins, right? So they're not reusing and disposing of things because we know what it does to the environment, not to mention the trees that are cut down. <laughs> we also know that bringing your cloth bags saves the environment from not using plastic bags or paper bags. And <laughs> we actually have these for sale on our table outside. But again, these are simple things that everybody knows in their everyday lives, especially here in California, what we can do to be more sustainable and to, to leave a lighter footprint on our planet. 
We know that having our own um, water bottles, bringing our own water bottles, using an old glass jar that you may have, is better than buying plastic water bottles. And in fact, it's horrible for the environment to constantly be using plastic water bottles, much less the companies that are privatizing water and making a profit off of something that should be everybody's right to access. There's also places that you can buy or you can keep, I keep in my purse, always have silverware with me. So if I'm eating out or something, I don't have to use um, plastic or even corn. Um, again, it's a waste of food to use things such as corn um, to make utensils. So always having these things available. There's a lot of certifications out there as well that talk about what's sustainable in terms of trees and how many trees you cut down and what you're printing on. Is it sustainable forests? There's also some companies that claim to be sustainable. So I just want to highlight a couple of them, including Organic Valley and Stonefield, Stonyfield, who are considered to be sustainable companies. So what does sustainable mean? So for Food Empowerment Project, Sustainable is actually in our mission statement. It is actually a part of what we de define our organization as being a sustainable one. Amy's, if y'all haven't been to Amy's in Roanart Park, um, it's a drive-through. Everything that they have vegetarian, they also have vegan. They have a, information on their wall about sustainability. And it talks about the building that they're in and how they used an old, um, I guess like a shack that was on the property and they turned it and they used it into tables. How they used old tire drums to make their table stands. There's also a company called Bon Appetit that um, they um, do food services for like schools and universities. This is how they define sustainability. So for an organization like us, when we look at something and we look at their definitions of sustainability, in my opinion, it's incredibly limiting because sustainability shouldn't just be based on environmental impact. It shouldn't just be about using resources and treating everything as commodities. They have what they call sustainable seafood. Well, if you ask the fish, there's no such thing as sustainable seafood because you know what? That fish needs their life in order to sustain themselves. So a lot of these companies want to point to things like this and say, we don't support this. This isn't sustainable because this is catching all sorts of animals, right? This is catching all sorts of fish and other animals that we don't need. So this is not sustainable. But they want to turn around and say, you know, there is some sort of sustainable fishing. But there's not. Because how we define sustainability and how we encourage other people to define sustainability is thinking about the individual and not surely thinking as mass production and commoditizing everything. So this fish, this little adorable tuna swimming around in the ocean, he needs the ocean to sustain himself, he needs the environment, he needs the ecology, and he needs his life. So to just say there's something called sustainable seafood does not exist for those of us who define sustainable as also recognizing and respecting individual lives. They also talk about they're humanely raised, and I know the previous talk was about this, so I won't go into it. So a company like Bon Appetit wants to say, we believe in humanely raising the animals, and they'll say, these types of things aren't sustainable. Cramming all these animals into these cages isn't sustainable. But to Joy, who is also considered poultry, according to the United States Department of Agriculture, her life is important to her. A lot of people are saying that um, having rabbits and having rabbits in your backyard is somehow sustainable, right? They eat produce. They breed really quickly. So somehow consuming animals and, and having these rabbits in your backyard is kind of like this new way of being sustainable. But for Joy, who was actually raised to be killed for meat, who I actually got to meet, and actually her rescuers are right here in the audience, so it's kind of weird to be here and talking about them. Um, um, I got to meet Joy, and she was so scared and so timid when I met her. She was hiding behind the toilet. She was so scared. But the, by the time her, her time with her fosters was done, she was like running over to me like, hello, you got treats for me? You know, but this is how her personality changed because she had the ability to live a life 
were with what sustained her. What sustained her was having the ability to move around, having the ability to love, to have the ability to cuddle, to have the ability to, to be happy. And that's what's sustainable. That's what sustains all of us, right? Our family, our colleagues, the joy that we can experience in life. So there's no such thing as sustainably raising animals for food if we want to use that term sustainable. And again, I will add as well that Joy has a right to her fur, not to be used by the fur industry. Joy has a right to her life, her eyes, her breathing, her skin, to not be used in experiments for any type of testing. Joy has a right to her life. <laughs> this is um, Autumn. She actually lives at Vine Sanctuary up in um, Vermont. And Vine is another reason that as an organization, again, Food Empowerment Project is a vegan organization and, and we are an ethically based organization. So for our reason for being vegan is because of these animals, because of animals like Autumn, who was raised in the dairy industry now, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but cows raised for the dairy industry have no control over their own bodies. Somebody makes all the decisions for her. They decide when she's going to be milked, and they decide when she's going to be pregnant. This female animal has no control of her own body because of an industry that sees fit to take all those choices away from her. This industry goes a step further to take away her babies as well. Oftentimes after birth, immediately after birth. Because if you think about it, y'all saw her, right? She's a very large animal. And what's she going to do after she gives birth? She wants to be with her baby. She wants to lick her baby. She wants to nuzzle her baby. But what does the industry want with her baby? They want to take her baby away from her because they want to sell her milk, Autumn's milk. But what would Autumn do? What would any mother do? She's going to fight to be with her baby. So they take them away immediately after birth so that the moms are so out of it they can't fight to be with their babies because they're not going to want to go up against fighting with this 1,000-pound animal. So as mentioned in my introduction, I've done investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouse, and I'm hoping this will work. But I'm going to play a little bit of sound from my investigation of a small dairy. Oops, there Oh, oh, oh. oh, and that didn't work. It's because I don't know how to use a mat. See, I keep, I thought I pushed that. Okay, but do I click this? <laughs> So that was um, in a small dairy farm that I investigated in Georgia. Again, and I'm sure this was mentioned in the previous talk, so I won't go into it too much. But again, large or small, it doesn't matter. Because no matter what, the dairy industry is there to make money off the milk. So they have to take the baby away from the mom in order to sell the milk. So they're always going to be separating the moms from the babies. So how sustainable is that, right? And I'm going to say that word 10,000 times during this. If anybody wants to comment, I totally know. I wrote a blog about this, and I'm like, I use this word 13 times. So who else is this not sustainable for? It's not sustainable for those workers, exactly. Who in their life wants to be killing animals all day long? Nobody wants to do that. And who ends up doing this in the industry are those who are the most vulnerable. They're many times undocumented. They don't speak the language. They are, there's so many abuses that take place in these industries um, from occupational safety issues, from sexual harassment, threats with deportation. So this industry is not even sustainable for human animals either, for the workers who are forced to work in this environment. It's also not sustainable for the environment. So we do regular protests, monthly protests, in front of a local chicken slaughterhouse in Petaluma, California. It's called Petaluma Poultry. We have some flyers on the table. Our next protest is on Friday, but we do do them once a month. But this chicken slaughterhouse uses 315,000 gallons of water every day for the slaughterhouse. They were given permission to expand during the drought. 
So this estimate is for 2012, and they're using municipal water supply. So we can say how sustainable is that for the environment and our water tables, and how sustainable is it for the community in Petaluma who's being told, reduce your water usage so that they're out there slaughtering chickens. It doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable. I could just have you all say that after everything I say. Um, but it's also not sustainable when you look at the environmental impact and pollution. So North Carolina is, has a, like the second largest pig killing state in the United States. The predominant number of people who live in these communities are people of color, African American as well as um, indigenous communities who live near these facilities. Their property values are pretty much down because who's going to want to live next to a pig farm? They experience nosebleeds. They can't open their windows in the summertime. I've investigated pig farms in North Carolina, and the stench was overwhelming, much less the communities who live near there. You have the same thing in California, where you have the dairy farms located in predominantly Latino communities. One dairy cow produces 120 pounds of wet manure per day. We have dairy farms as large as 25,000 cows in California. Again, who's most impacted by that? We call this environmental racism, where the majority of communities who are, who are impacted by negative pollutants are communities of color. So you have the same thing here in California, where you have incredibly high rates of asthma. So how sustainable is this for those communities? You can say how sustainable is for the planet, but how sustainable is it for these communities to be forced to live with that? It's an outrageous injustice that these people are living with this. So as an organization such as ours, we're encouraging people to go vegan for the sake of the animals. We have to look at our food as well as, is it sustainable? And we look at those people who produce our food. So credit to Bon Appetit for this at least, they do take a look at farm workers. They too take a look at the over 3 million farm workers in the United States who produce our food. They've um, pledged, sign and again, I know nothing about this company. I just looked them up and thought they actually go through all the sustainability stuff. Uh, but they do uh, make a pledge with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, which I'll talk about. But I want to talk about farm workers who pick our food and how sustainable is the current system for them. You have 40, 400,000, approximately 40, 400,000 children who pick food in the United States, produce, for all of us to eat. Not just vegans, but everybody, right? They endure working in all types of um, temperatures, extreme temperatures. Um, a lot of them are homeless because they're not being paid well in order to afford a roof over their head. They live along the creeks and the rivers. Many of them live 16 members of a family in a one bedroom. The Coalition of Immokalee Workers, who we strongly support, are just asking for one more penny per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. One penny more is all that they're asking for. And corporations like Wendy's are saying, no, we're not going to pay you that one more penny. So even though Wendy's has a veggie burger that's vegan, we actually ask vegans to boycott Wendy's and tell Wendy's why you're boycotting them, because they're not sustainable for the farm workers. Of course, they're selling dead animals, too, and that's not sustainable. But we know vegans are very much on this thing about Wendy's having a vegan burger. But we think it's important that they understand that we see the connection and we understand that if those farm workers aren't getting what they need, Wendy's isn't getting a buck from us. The, <clears throat> the average lifespan of a farm worker is 49 years old. What makes it worse in California is that we have labor camps in California. Labor camps which require farm workers when they're not when they're not picking, when picking season isn't going on, they require the farm workers to move 50 miles away from that labor camp, which means when their children are still in school but the picking season is over, they're forced to kick their kids out of school. They have to take their kids out of school and move 50 miles away. Why? Well, that's the thing. They, there's um, a regulation that basically says that this is the way it's supposed to be, but we can't, no one can find the legislative history to why it was created. So we work with a coalition, um, one is called the Human Agenda, where they actually went out and surveyed residents living in these labor camps and asked them, do you believe that your child is impacted by this regulation? 91% said yes. 
Then they were asked, do you think that their, your child would benefit from being able to stay in school year round? 96.7% said yes. The agency responsible for overseeing this said this wasn't enough data in order to change anything. Even though it's research done from these facilities, they say it's not enough to change this regulation. So what Food Empowerment Project recently did is we sent a strongly worded letter to the department letting them know that we want them to change this and allow farm workers, give them consideration. If they have the ability to stay so their child can finish school, Again, what study doesn't say a child does better when they don't have to change schools? Um, that we will make sure that the people of California speak out and let them know that we care about the children of farm workers and we want them to succeed. Farm workers sacrifice so much for their children to be able to go to school that this is a grave injustice that's taking place. And what? It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable for them to be prevented the ability to go to school. It's not sustainable for us to be treating farm workers in this way. Food Empowerment Project also organized the school supply drives for the children of farm workers. Last year, we collected over 340 backpacks filled with school supplies for the children of farm workers. These are some of the happy recipients from last year. These kids live in Watsonville. All of their parents are undocumented. They're all from Oaxaca, Mexico. And I can never choose between the boys and the girls. So why is that to show the boys and the girls? Um, we will be doing this school supply drive again this year. Um, dates of July 11th through the 25th. We have drop-off locations throughout the Bay Area. Um, in Berkeley, it's going to be at La Peña um, Cultural Arts Center. And at PANA is going to be in Oakland, the Pesticide Action Network. We'll be posting all of this information on our website but we will have drop-off locations throughout the Bay Area to donate school supplies. We do not see this as an act of charity. We see this as righting an injustice and a wrong that's taking place to the farm workers and are doing our little part to show them that they matter to us and telling their children we want them to succeed. Another area where we find is unsustainable is access to healthy foods. Not all communities have access to healthy foods. And unfortunately, in this country, it seems to be a privilege in order to eat healthy instead of a right that it should be. Many people in communities of color are what's called time poor and cash poor. So not, they may be working two to three jobs, but they're still having a hard time making ends meet. So we work on the issue of lack of access to healthy food. Um, we don't call it a food desert, but that's typically what people think of that these areas where you have predominantly fast food and liquor stores in these areas and not a lot of ability for people to access fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, we did work. We did an assessment on access to healthy foods in Santa Clara County where we compared high-income areas and low-income areas. And no shock on what we found. Low-income communities did not have the same access to fresh fruits and vegetables as well as frozen and canned as the higher-income areas did. So some information from our findings. Our researchers didn't find organic to be statistically significant in communities of color and in the low-income communities. We asked them to put it on there anyway. Higher-income areas had 14 times more access to frozen vegetables than the other communities did. And again, we're talking about what's sustainable. And to me, my definition of sustainable includes everybody. Not just the wealthy, not just the white. It includes everybody to have a sustainable lifestyle, which means that they and their children can thrive. We also surveyed for meat and dairy alternatives. And the reason why we did this is because we're a vegan organization, and we believe that everybody has the right to eat their ethics. If they don't want to support suffering of non-human animals, they have the right to be able to do that. But we also did it because we know a diet higher in fruits and vegetables is much healthier than a diet high in animal products. We also know that many people of color are, are what's called lactose intolerant, meaning we can't digest lactose, meaning we can't digest milk. We try, we're working on not using the word lactose intolerant because it implies there's something wrong with those of us who can't digest the milk of another species into adulthood, <laughs> when frankly there's nothing wrong with us. <laughs> Colonization is what brought, I'm a Chicana, very proud Chicana, my family's from Mexico. 
found out recently I'm majority Native American, which is also very cool. Um, but we have information on our website called Colonial Eating, and it really talks about how Columbus is the one who brought all these animals over. I mean, he's the one who brought the cows over. We wouldn't, that's why we can't digest that cow's milk. It's just not normal for us. It's not normal for our diet. So after we did this work in Santa Clara County where we made the assessment, we also went back to the community and we did focus groups in San Jose, which is where all the most impacted communities were, to find out what their needs were. Because what we found over time is that it's almost always well-intentioned NGOs um, or government officials who are going into our communities and saying, this is what you need. You need a farmer's market. You need a Walmart. You need all these things without talking to the community. Success and what's going to work is going to come from our communities, not somebody from the outside coming in. So we did uh, our focus groups where we talked to um, three different groups in San Jose. All of our focus groups were done in Spanish. Um, we put out our report. I'll mention as well that in three of these, two of these focus groups, families had children who were um, vegan. So this report is available. All of our stuff is available in English and in Spanish. We put out a report, and what we found, and this is very a quick summation, is that one of the biggest impacts that people had on being able to attain healthy food, fruits and vegetables, was not so much proximity, although that definitely was a barrier. That was number two. The number one barrier was the cost of the food. The other thing we found out was that a lot of the people in these focus groups were immigrants. And they were eating healthier in their homeland than they were when they came, than since they've come to the United States. Because where they were living before, they were able to grow their own tomatoes. They were able to grow their own produce. And all of a sudden, they come to the United States, and they're being forced to cook with things like tomato sauce, because that's the only thing that the convenience store sells. And they didn't want it. They weren't, how do you cook what they're used to cooking with tomato sauce? Um, and again, we found out that a number of them were vegans, as well as a lot of them were already buying things like soy milk and almond milk because it stayed good later. Milk would expire, but the almond milk and the soy milk stays better longer. So when you look at things like this, which is um, we're currently doing work in Vallejo, um, which is not too far. And again, we, we follow environmental justice principles, so we only go into communities when we're asked to. And one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party actually asked us to take a look at what was happening in Vallejo and make an assessment. So this is one of the places we went in to survey. And you can see they have a couple of potatoes. And this is blurry because she said, did you just take a picture? And I said, no, of course not. <laughs> and some apples and some bananas. How is this sustainable for other people to be able to live? It's not. This is also the picture I like to show people who talk about veganism and who promote veganism to remember to not say things like it's easy for anybody to go vegan. Because it's not easy for anybody to go vegan. Oh, I like talking in the Bay Area. Thank you for getting what I'm saying. Um, so again, I said we're doing our work in Vallejo right now, and this is just some of the preliminary information that we found so far, which is, if it wasn't like, it, like I say it's like disgusting, but it's heartbreaking, where you have over 93% of the liquor stores in Vallejo are in low-income neighborhoods. Over, when we say that over 70% of the fruits and vegetables are available only canned in jars, it's really canned. Our researchers canned and jarred were together, but as somebody who did the surveying, almost all of it was cans. This is also, so Vallejo in general doesn't have good access to healthy foods, um, but it's clearly worse in low-income communities. So in our work, one of the things that, you know, like how do people make a difference on this issue? If you care about the injustice that's happening in this unsustainable situation that's happening for communities of color that don't have access to healthy foods. Again, we believe in working within the community. The work that we do, the reports that we put out, we give to the community so they can fundraise off of it. They can prove to policymakers the problem exists and their work is important. So they can give those reports to foundations and say, this is why our work is important. But what can we do in this room if we're not living in those communities and we're not working in those communities? Support living wages. Everybody can do your part to support a living wage. I know that California just signed the living wage increase, well, I shouldn't call it living wage, the $15 an hour. 
But the fight for 15 still goes on because it's not going to be $15 an hour for quite some time. So we need to support all the restaurant workers who are asking for 15, all the fast food workers who are asking for 15. Every city, every community, every county, everybody who's fighting for the living wage, that's something we can all do, is lend our voices to support the living wages. So this is me being really arrogant, quoting myself. Um, <laughs> but it's from my blog. But basically saying that we define what it means to be sustainable. We can be part of making sustainable not just be, you know, what kind of trees are you cutting down or how much water are you using to make sure that we're keeping the human and the non-human sacrifices and exploitation and suffering those in part of the equation of what's sustainable. Because sustainability seems to be different definitions by different people and different entities and different corporations. So I say we define sustainability. We define it to make sure that it stands for what we believe in and that it stands for a more equitable and just society. Thanks. Go ahead. Oh, so you weren't listening to me the whole time. That's fine. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Go ahead. No, it's very helpful. Now I know Trader Joe's isn't on the list, and I won't buy from them anymore. And also for redefining the word sustainable, that's so important. And two quick questions. One, I just wanted to check. When you played the sounds of the cows, was, that was when the... Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that's a mom and a baby bellowing back and forth to each other. So basically, no. So where I was, which was in Georgia, it was a calf, a, a female, because again, they put the females in crates. It was a female in a cage that she couldn't even turn around in, in the front, and her mom was way on the other side of the farm. And they were bellowing back and forth to each other. Yeah. And, thanks. and then the, the other um, quick question, I was wondering, as far as for the Immokalee workers, I, I thought they had won their campaign for a one-cent increase, and I was just wondering if a they didn't win it with Wendy's yet, okay. nor Publix. They've won it with Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and Taco Bell and a whole bunch of other fast food and grocery stores, but Wendy's and Publix have not budged yet. In fact, Wendy's is now saying they're going to get their tomatoes from Mexico. So, okay, thank you. sure. It's, it's, it's our chocolate app of um, companies we do and don't recommend based on where they source their chocolate from. I think it's just called FEP List. <laughs> That's how creative it is. Um, if you go to our website, you can go to chocolate or chocolate list, and then you can download it directly from our website. And also, what is the term that you prefer to use for lactose I'm still trying to figure that out. I need a brilliant wordsmither. I just don't have that brilliant, because I just, you know, all these, yeah, we, we've been trying. I think it, I can... If you've watched talks from me from a year, I'm probably still saying I'm working on it. But. Do you have a handy resource or is it on Vicar or something for people who are going through farm worker labor fights? So like the Wendy's thing, that came to my attention well after. Yeah. How do we keep on top of it? Well, we try to post things. Um, the other boycott going on right now is against Driscoll's, um, which is the Sakuma workers. Um, so... Um, I don't know if there's one place for it. Um, we do, on our social media, we post all the different uh, campaigns that are going on. But I don't know, because I don't know that if the Immokalee workers will post about the Sakumas and the Sakumas post, but we'll post for both of them. Um, I don't know enough about, like, I, I have a BlackBerry, which I think is a smartphone, but doesn't seem to get any apps, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> about, you know, sort of this vision of what a sustainable agriculture would look like. Do, are there examples in the world that you've seen or thoughts that you have about 
what what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen it, but I would say Cuba's um, probably is the closest thing we have that after, I won't go in my whole lesson about this, but basically um, when the Soviet Union broke down, they were unable to provide as much oil and gas and help to the, Cuba. So Cuba became their own entity and started working on things. So they started all these organic gardens because they didn't have the ability to have all these pesticides and agricultural chemicals. So they created urban gardens all over the place so that they could feed themselves and they didn't use any agricultural chemicals. So it's really, it was very locally based. And I think that's the closest thing that I know of. I mean, it's like somebody asked me, I spoke at, at the law school at Berkeley this week, and they were asking me, like, how do we do this? And I was like, short of a revolution, I'm not sure, because I don't know how we break down to once again be so local, you know, because that's really how you can do it. Because again, like for the communities that we're talking about, it's like, we want everybody to be able to grow their own food, but not everybody like me. I've lived in apartments my whole life. I've never had land, so how do I do it? You know, so some of it's having worker-owned cooperatives. You know, so how do we break down to go back to this where the money from the worker-owned cooperatives go back to the community? And you know, it's like I don't know how to go back to how I think it should be, other than a revolution, which I know it's like whoa, crazy, <laughs> but I don't mean it that way, and I don't mean to say something that's unattainable. I just don't know how to break the system we're currently in right now, except for the local, and I don't mean like buy local, go local, I just mean like serious, like community by community, taking care of each other, not like within 60 miles or something. I was wondering, has anyone uh, done research on the links of factory farming to gentrification? Not that I know of. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Sorry. Well, there's evidence of factory farming. Again, factory farms predominantly go in communities of color. So there's not going to be, that doesn't bring gentrification. It just brings pollution and bad smells. And, you know, so nobody wants to live there, unfortunately. But, yeah, sorry. Anybody? Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, there's, there's a perception that communities of color are, are not interested in, in uh, coming into the community. Sure. I think that we've done, the movement has done some damage in that regard. I think that what we can do is not use hashtags like All Lives Matter. Um, I think that's a one first step. I think not promoting people like Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who's a known racist, but just because he does good things for farmed animals doesn't mean he's good on other issues. He basically is trying to criminalize being brown in Arizona. Um, so I think we've done things like that that have proven to be really harmful. Um, I think that a lot of the people of color who I know who are vegan, a lot of times they're very wary of the animal rights movement, rightly so, because of these things that, how do you, I mean, how do you deal with hashtag all lives matter when we have like black teenagers being shot in the streets, you know? But I think that some of it's also showing we're not so focused on non-human animals only and to hell with everybody else. A lot of the people of color I know who are vegans are like, you know, they love Food Empowerment Project, but they don't want to go to the animal rights conferences, but they're happy that our work exists because they do care about it, but they just don't want to be part of this mainstream animal rights movement, you know? And so I think, not just speaking about myself, but I will implicitly, is for people to support um, vegan animal rights groups who are run by people of color. You know, we don't get much funding at all. You know, Breeze, Dr. Breeze Harper, who lives in the, bay, in the area. You have the Black Vegans Rock. I mean, the three of us could really use some financial support. We don't have cute animals from sanctuaries to show you, but sure as hell are trying to do good work, and we just don't get the exposure that a lot of these groups do. So I think some of that's true. Make sure our, voice, our, our faces are getting out there, because that's going to, I mean, how many, you know, young Chicanas am I so excited to talk about? I was like, oh, you look like me, and I love, you know, just if there's a connection there. So if you don't see more of us speaking, you know, and again, kudos to this conference for making sure that uh, we were out here, but that's some of us too. And, and you know, when I talk about like Breeze and AF, the people who run Black Vegans Rock and myself, it's like, you know, we want to have more exposure as well because we know that we're, we're just all on the same page here. It's just we're kind of making it more broad. And to us, I mean, like, people want me to speak about my investigations of factory farms and slaughterhouses. Well, I can't do that anymore without talking about factory farm, about um, produce workers. I can't promote veganism and not talk about the suffering of 
my people in the fields, you know? It's, it's difficult. So, anyway, really good question, and I thank you because it's something that I gave a whole, like, rant and rave talk about it recently, and I think everybody hated me afterwards, but I, you know, it's pent up in me. So I have two minutes if anybody has any more questions. Woohoo! Oh. Uh, we're a nonprofit 501c3. That's all I can say. <laughs> but I will say that, I mean, regardless if you, if you believe in voting for president or not, I know some of us are not going to be voting for president, um, but some of us um, do believe in voting and the importance of voting. And um, I'm going to write a whole blog on why voting is important. And all of our people, women, every woman in this room who has the thanks to people like Lucy Burns, and Allison Paul for giving us the right to vote and all they sacrificed as well as all the black activists and the Chicano activists who fought for us to have the ability to vote. I think I am allowed to say that stuff. I already checked with my attorney. I'm sorry. I'm like, oh no, I'm going to go off on this again. But it's so important for us to remember all the sacrifices that people made. I know white men, you always had this privilege because this whole country was revolving around you. But for the rest of us, it wasn't that way. And so it's really important that we remember the sacrifices that people made for us to have the ability to vote. So even if you just find one thing to vote for, I ask people just to find one thing to vote for, for all the people that sacrificed so much. I don't think I can do that. Um, we have our table outside. People sign up to our sign-up sheet, and we have more leaflets and everything. And thank you all so much.